We provide you with the lowest per GB rates, night or day. SLT 4G, driving you ever forward. Development Drive. The newly constructed Matra Belyatha railway track tested for the first time. However, not all are pleased. No instability. Minister Manuga Nation asserts that Sri Lanka's political situation is stable. The Northern Airport Development Project will go ahead. Democracy must prevail. Opposition leader Mahindra Rajapaksha says that constitutions cannot be passed by force. Accountability is a must. Murali says cricket administration and its players should take equal responsibility for shortcomings. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine on this Sunday, 6 January 2019. May Smart Android Park Vistar TV Onema Singer Pradashana Gariti. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Hello, very good evening and welcome to First at Nine, another than a 24-7 Sri Lanka's news channel. And well, it's a historic day as the first railway constructed of the British colonial era in Sri Lanka saw its maiden test run today. The test run of the Mathura and Beliata stretch, which is part of the first phase of the Southern Railway Expansion Project was held under patronage of Minister of Transport and Civil Aviation, Arjuna Ranatunga. Now, once completed, the project will allow commuters to travel between Matara to Katagama much faster and in a convenient manner. The 26.75 km Matara Belyat extension boasts of having the longest and second longest railway bridges, one of the tallest railway bridges, the longest railway tunnel, as well as the most modern railway station buildings in the country. Matara had been the southern destination for railway commuters since Sri Lanka's railway network was established by the British during the colonial era. However, expanding the railway network had been a necessity for a few decades, and as a result, the decision to expand the southern railway track by 113 kilometers from Matara to Kataragama was materialized. The first phase of the Southern Railway Expansion Project, the track between Mathara to Beliatta, has now been completed. Under the second phase, the line will be extended from Beliatta to Hambantota, and the third phase will see the tracks being extended to Kataragama. The railway will have six stations, including the four main stations of Kaikandura, Bamarenda, Vaurukannala, and Beliatta, and two substations. All main stations will have underground crossings for the commuters to travel between platforms. The track from Matara to Beliatta will feature both the longest railway tunnel and longest railway bridge in Sri Lanka. The 615-metre-long railway tunnel has already been constructed in Nakutia near the Kaikandura railway station. Meanwhile, the 1.5-kilometre-long railway bridge will be located near the Vattegama area. Another special feature in the railway line is that it will contain eight automated crossing gates. The railway line will also see trains with speed up to 120 km per hour travelling on its tracks, making it the track with the fastest trains in Sri Lanka. With the 21-metre Beheragoda Bridge, the line also boasts the tallest railway bridge in the country. First phase of the railway extension project costing 278.2 million US dollars was financed by the Exim Bank of China. China National Machinery Import and Export Corporation acts as the main contractor of the project, while China Railway No. 5 Engineering Group Co. Limited, a subsidiary of China Railway Construction Corporation, did the bulk of the construction. The maiden test run of the railway stretch between Mathara Beliata was held today under the patronage of Minister of Transport and Civil Aviation, Arjuna Ranatunga. It seems that we will be able to open the railway track before the Singhala and Tamil New Year. Construction of the railway line up to Beliatta is almost completed. Once the signal system is finalized, we will be able to use the track. Before the test run commenced today, SLPP Provincial Councillor of Beliatta, Cyril Munasingha, and a group of supporters of the party engaged in a protest at the station. 
They raised opposition against former President Mahinda Rajapaksa, who initiated the Southern Railway expansion project, not being invited to for the maiden test run. Several other protests by supporters of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna were also held during the test run today. Minister Ranatunga had this to say in response of these protests. No one should make this a political spectacle because none of these development projects are done with my money. Neither were they done with Mahindra Rajpaksha's, the President's or Prime Minister's money. All these development projects take place with the money of Sri Lankan taxpayers. And I don't like to politicise this. This is the way how things were done before 2015 and we will not let anyone return to those practices. Minister of National Integration, Official Languages, Social Progress and Hindu Religious Affairs, Manu Ganeshan emphasizes that despite various claims by different parties, there is no political instability in the country. He says that since the new cabinet of ministers undertook development activities, Sri Lanka is moving ahead smoothly. Minister Ganeshan made the remark following inquiries over foreign media reports which claim that India has delayed Northern Airport Development Project in Sri Lanka owing to political instability. Saudi-based Arab News yesterday reported that India-led project to modernize a northern Sri Lankan airport was delayed due to political instability of the country. In September last year, Sri Lanka inked the agreement to develop Palali Airport in the northern part of the country with the Airports Authority of India. The article went on to say that India's Ministry of External Affairs didn't give the permission for the Airport Authority of India to press ahead with its proposed redesign of Palali Airport as it was waiting for the Sri Lanka's political climate to settle. Meanwhile, India's Minister of State for Aviation, Jayant Singha, had told the Parliament earlier this week that the AAI had signed an agreement to prepare a detailed project report for developing the Palali Airport in Sri Lanka, seeking the approval from the Ministry of External Affairs. However, speaking to First at Nine on the matter, Minister of National Integration, Official Languages, Social Progress and Hindu Religious Affairs, Manu Ganesan said that the Palali Airport project will go ahead as planned. There is no question about political instability in Sri Lanka today. There was a brief instability, but it is over now. The issue of India developing Palali Airport, let us look at the larger picture. There are certain forces which are opposed to India coming into Sri Lanka and engaging itself in the developing, developing activities. On the other hand, you must see the most successful actor in Sri Lanka is Kalabu Fort. Kalabu Fort is the most successful port in Kalabu, Sri Lanka. But the hidden factor is that this fort is surviving because of the container transportation to Indian ports, Indian mainland. Those containers meant for India are put down at Kalabu Fort and collected by Indian small vessels from Kalambu. If not for that, Colombo Abu Dhabi been a loss making Abu. So therefore, India is always helping us. India is always a friend of us. Now, there had been discussions between the subject ministers of Sri Lanka and India. I don't think so. There is any obstacle in the Indian side. India had been uh, prepared for this uh, uh, project uh, since a couple of years before. The delay is only on our side. Chairman of the United National Party, Minister Kavi Hashim, says that the government should be more flexible to the needs of the public while correcting its mistakes and shortcomings. He made his remarks at an event held in Kegor yesterday. For the first time in the history of our country, the Tamil National Alliance has agreed to live under a unitary state. We are continually accused of dividing the country. I am the chairman of the UNP and I am a Muslim, but I assure that the unitary state will prevail and the prominence given to Buddhism will never change. We too have our shortcomings and we have many mistakes. We have to be more flexible towards the needs of the majority of the Sinhala people. <laughs> Thank you.
Meanwhile, opposition leader Mahindra Rajapaksa says that constitutions cannot be passed by force. Speaking at the event in Ampara, the opposition leader also questioned the priority given to Buddhism within the constitution. Meanwhile, expressing his views to media at a separate event in Kurunagala, Mahindra Rajapaksa voiced his doubt on whether the presidential elections will be held, noting it is only up to the president to decide when it is to take place. Opposition leader Mahinda Rajapaksa met with Kurunagala Bishop Harold Anthony at the official residence of Catholic Bishop in Kurunagala today. The opposition leader also visited the Skanda Kovil in Kurunagala following the meeting. <laughs> We can go for a presidential election at any time after next Tuesday, but it should be decided by the president. I doubt that the president will go for an early presidential election. I represent the opposition. I came to the parliament representing the SLFP. Therefore, I represent the SLFP. Think about why the party was formed. UPFA parliamentarians came to the opposition after discussing with the president. When we function as an opposition, we need a symbol. The SLPP was formed to fulfill this requirement. It became the country's most powerful party. It defeated both the United National Party and the SLFP at the local authorities election. The SLFP and the SLPP have now joined hands. There are no further questions. Meanwhile, opposition leader Mahinda Rajapaksa participated at a religious function held in Ampara yesterday. Most factions said that Buddhism has been given the foremost place in the present constitution as well as the constitution which is to be introduced. But we doubt if this is in fact taking place. The constitution cannot be passed forcibly. Therefore, it must be remembered that any constitution that comes into play must be agreed by all nationalities in the country. Well, we all know that 2019 is going to be an election year. However, in the backdrop where there is no final agreement as to which electoral system will be used for the upcoming provincial council elections, various views are being expressed in the political arena. It is in such a backdrop that Minister of Health Dr. Raj Nasena Ratna claims that a presidential election will be held before a provincial council's elections. An election can't be held just because people demand one. If we want to go for an election, the parliament must be dissolved with a two-thirds majority. Otherwise, the president could dissolve the parliament after four and a half years. This is why there will be a presidential election first, and let's see what happens after. We asked them to first hold the provincial council election, then a presidential election, and finally a parliamentary election. We hope to hold all these elections soon. We hope to make him the presidential candidate in the upcoming election. We need to reorganize for that, but we must first need his decision on the matter. He hasn't spoken to us about this. We can nominate the presidential candidate or any other candidate anytime. We first hope to win the presidential election and hold the power of the head of state. We then plan to win the parliamentary election and get the prime minister and a cabinet appointed. So, we also hope to win the provincial council election. We will ensure the power of the country. We very much like it if members of the SLFP, such as Duminda Disanayaka, joined hands with us. We have no problem moving forward as a country, even by joining hands with former President Chandrika Bandarnaka Kumartunga. Now we will have some business news on the other side. Make sure you stay tuned for that. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel, Other Dharana 24-7.
Well, it was a rough week for the Colombo Stock Exchange as it posted its lowest daily turnover in 10 years, which was a mere 68.77 million rupees. Little over 3.14 million shares changing hands among traders this Friday. During the week, the All-Share Price Index gained 0.07%, while the S&P 20 lost 0.31%. At least, however, expect the market to continue to have low market turnover in the upcoming week as well as investors are still awaiting a proper direction in the economic front. We now have Yuruni Perena from First Capital Holdings with the market forecast. We expect overall activities in both the debt and equity market on to be slow side and gradually pick up thereafter as market participants are slightly getting activated just after the festive season. Debt market is likely to witness a wait and see approach until the conclusion of the first bond auction for the year to be held on 11 January 2019. Equity market, local buying interest and turnover levels are likely to remain low, adopting a wait and see approach as investors are looking out for a proper direction in the economic front. We expect the overall market to remain moderate on thin volumes. A delegation of U.S. officials, including Deputy U.S. Trade Representative Jeffrey Garish, arrived in Beijing today ahead of several days of trade talks with Chinese officials. The talks, which are scheduled to begin tomorrow, will be the first U.S.-China face-to-face trade talks since U.S. President Donald Trump and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping met in December and agreed to a 90-day truce in the trade. Trump has slapped import tariffs on hundreds of billions of dollars of Chinese goods as he seeks concessions from Beijing on issues ranging from industrial subsidies to hacking. China, however, has retaliated. The tit-for-tat tariffs have disrupted trade, hurt manufacturing, roiled international markets and slowed the global economy. While Trump and other officials have said talks between the two sides are progressing well, they have given no details on concessions that China has made. Some U.S. demands would require structural reform that may be unpalatable for Chinese leaders. A commentary in the ruling Communist Party's official newspaper said recently, China would deepen reform but will not yield on issues it deems to be its core national interests. The upcoming talks will be the first formal negotiations on trade between the world's two biggest economies since President Donald Trump and his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, agreed to truce at G20 summit in Argentina last month. After its historic landing on Thursday, China's latest lunar rover, Jade Rabbit 2, is now rolling on the far side of the moon for more scientific explorations. The Jade Rabbit 2 will survey lunar terrain during the moon's daytime, which lasts until January 12th. After that, a 14-day long moon night is expected to come. The landing is being seen as a major milestone in space exploration. Jade Rabbit 2's first footprints on the dark side of the moon is the latest development of China's Chang'e 4 lunar mission, which achieved the first soft landing on the far side of the moon on Thursday. So far, the rover and the relay satellite have successfully established an independent data link and carried out scientific exploration as planned and the lunar radar, panoramic camera and other equipment are also operating normally. The probe landed in the one common crater within the South Pole Aiken Basin, a location ideal for the exploration of the moon. As the moon itself blocks the Earth's radiation interference, the far side of the moon has a perfectly quiet environment for astronomical observation. In order to reduce heat generated by its own work, the rover will have a break when it's appropriate, leaving only part of the subsystem working. The mobile subsystem will stop working and the rover is expected to be waken up on the 10th of January. Just a day after U.S. President Donald Trump threatened to keep the government partially shut for months or even years, he now uh, took a U-turn, saying that discussions to end the partial government shutdown will resume. He, however, is still adamant on his decision on the border wall between the United States and Mexico. Following fresh talks yesterday, the leader of Trump's team, Vice President Mike Pence, was a little more positive talking of a productive discussion as the stalemate enters its third week. Critics, meanwhile, highlights that with both sides apparently refusing to budge, there's little sign of any breakthrough from further discussions. Senior Trump administration officials met with Democratic congressional staffers yesterday 
but failed to break a deadlock over a proposed border wall and end a two-week-old partial government shutdown. Vice President Mike Pence, however, said the meeting was productive and that both sides agreed meet for further talks. U.S. President Donald Trump, meanwhile, tweeted that there was not much headway made in talks with Democratic Party representatives yesterday. U.S. President is demanding $5.6 billion to build a wall along the U.S. border with Mexico, but Democrats in control of the House of Representatives this week passed a bill to reopen the government without providing additional funding for the wall. Trump says he will not sign the bill until he gets the money for the wall. With the two sides sticking to their positions, a quarter of the federal government has been closed for two weeks, leaving 800,000 public workers unpaid. A new rule in Saudi Arabia is going to ensure that Saudi women know about their own divorces. Starting from today, courts will be required to notify women by text on rulings confirming their divorces. Local female lawyers suggest the measure will end what are known as secret divorce cases where men end a marriage without telling their wives. The directive would ensure women are fully aware of their marital status and can protect rights such as alimony. Last year, a decade-old driving ban on women was lifted in Saudi Arabia. However, women will still remain subject to male guardianship laws. The new step is said to be part of economic and social reforms pushed by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, such as allowing women to attend football matches and work in jobs traditionally reserved for men. And with that, we cut across to a short commercial break. Make sure you stay tuned. You are watching Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel, Other Verena 24-7. Now, following a series of revelations about corruption and malpractices in the country's uh, cricketing arena, in the, the integrity of Sri Lanka cricket has been continuously questioned. Former players and politicians were seen actively airing their thoughts in the recent past regarding corruption and the dip in form of Sri Lanka cricket. Speaking to First at Nine, veteran cricketer Siddharth Vettamuni says that off-field antics including malpractices and corruption can have a bad effect on players on the field. If there is instability and uh, corruption, there will always be doubts in the minds of players. And if there is a situation where players are underperforming, it would certainly be an issue. However, the, the good news is that the ICC is setting up an anti-corruption unit here, and hopefully that will keep things clean. He added that in the words of a World Cup, the key at this stage is a stable environment for players. Poor management has been one of the issues for sure. And when there is instability at the top and when there is improper focus, uh, the result is the players are also affected by it. So we've had so much turbulence in the last couple of years. I'm not surprised at the way our players have performed. I don't think we lack talent. All we need is the right direction and the right motivation. And uh, hopefully things will turn for the better. few months to go for the World Cup. The key at this stage is stability. And as long as we can have a stable environment where the players can focus on their cricket and be directed the proper way, I think we should start getting better. And the people who have been in power are responsible for it. We have tolerated all sorts of horrible things like match fixing in local games and no action being taken. We've got to blame ourselves for the situation we are in. And now we can only hope that this will get cleaned up and some Prevail. Minister of Sports Harin Fernando conveying to media the outcome of a meeting with Alex Marshall of the International Cricket Council's anti-corruption unit said recently that the ICC offered an amnesty period to Sri Lanka players to come clean about any involvement in corrupt activities, breach of conduct or to reveal information on player behaviour tarnishing the spirit of the game. But it is noteworthy that no player was seen coming forth in this regard so far. Lamenting the state of Sri Lanka cricket, Spain King Muttaya Muridharan says that the cricket administration and its players should take equal responsibility in its shortcomings that have been witnessed in the recent past. 
Speaking to journalists following an event in Hatton yesterday, Mulidharan went on to say that the downfall is temporary and affirmed that the team consists of talented players. <laughs> මම හිතනවා අපි හිටපු තත්ත්වය අවුරුදු 20ක් විතර මේ ලෝකෙම ඉතම්ම දවන්තම කණ්ඩායමක් හැටියට අවුරුදු 20ක් අපි හිටියා අපිට qualification එකක්වත් ගහන්න වෙනවා world cup එකක් qualify කරන්න ඒ තත්ත්වයට වැටිලා තියෙන්නේ ඒ කියන්නේ පසුබිමක් තියෙන්නේ ඒ තාවකාලික පසුබිමක් මම කියන්නේ නැහැ දක්ෂ ක්‍රීඩකයෝ නැත්තේ කියලා මේකට අපි සුදුසු කට්ටිය දාලා තියෙනවනේ ඒගොල්ලන් තමයි පිළිතුරු හොයන්න ඕනේ ඇයි මේ මූණේ මේ වලට විසඳුමුත් හොයන්න ඕනේ ඒගොල්ලන් අපිට එළියේ ඉඳන් විසඳුම් දෙන්න හරි අමාරුයි ඇතුල්